Hey everyone, welcome back. We have a good time for you planned and it's going to be a little bit different than normal. We've been following that lectionary reading schedule pretty faithfully and I think by now you're starting to get a little bit in tune and trained on that and just in time for us to pull out the rug from underneath you and, and switch gears. We are uh, going to observe this weekend Reformation and so Typically, you know, Reformation happens at the end of October, October 31st, but with All Saints Day happening on November 1st, that Sunday, we're going to commit to those readings, and we'd like to observe and use the Reformation readings, because we don't want to miss that. It's an important part of who we are in our church body, and so we're going to observe it a week early, and that's a pretty typical practice, honestly, so you'll see that with many churches, that they observe certain celebrations the week prior, the closest Sunday to when that event happens. So that's why we're going to do it this way. So any thoughts on that, Rolfra? Nope. Got got to cover Reformation if you're yeah. Lutheran. So this is it. This is, a, this is a big day. We only wear red a few times each year. And one right. of those festival days where we wear red, which is a color that reminds us of the work of the Holy Spirit, right. is... Reformation Day, even though it's only a Reformation Day observed, we're observing it. <laughs> Sounds good. I got to get a new mask now. Everyone's going to be asking me. That's right. You need a red mask. Yeah, I got to get a red mask now. Figure that out. Yeah, uh, we'll see. Anyway, one of the big things that comes up for the Reformation readings is Psalm 46. And I thought we would use a select verses from that for our prayer this morning. It also really ties neatly with that, that famous hymn, A Mighty Fortress. So this is where some of that language comes from. We're going to look at Psalm 46, verses 1, 10, and 11, and we'll use that as our prayer uh, for our study. If you'll join with me. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Amen. Amen. All right. Unlike most of the reading selections we've been through, we aren't going to start in the Old Testament this time. We're actually going to start in the book of Revelation. So we're going to go to all the way to the end of your Bibles, and we're going to go to a verse that you've heard every time on Reformation. It's Revelation 14, verses 6 and 7. Very short, but You'll hear it, and then we've got some new, unique connections here, even in a manual to this verse, and we'll, we'll share that in a second. So, Pastor Eggold, why don't we start there? You bet. Very brief reading, but you'll uh, recognize, hopefully when we're done with this discussion, the connection to this festival of the church. Then I saw another angel flying directly overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth. To every nation and tribe and language and people. And he said with a loud voice, Fear God and give him glory, because the hour of his judgment has come, and worship him who made heaven and earth, the sea, and the springs of water. That's it. Just like that. Thank you. Yeah, just like that. And it, it's um it's brief, but there are some key words that tie this to the, the Reformation celebration. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And one of those key words is, or phrases anyway, is uh, eternal gospel. Right. right. What is, what's the connection to Reformation? Okay. Well, one of the things we, we see there is that you have this message that is unending. You know, it goes on forever. It's the message that the Lord proclaimed all the way back into the Garden of Eden, you know, to Adam and Eve that continued down from generation to generation, those promises that the Lord would fulfill in Jesus Christ. And it continued even into Acts, into the early church, and was the message that was really, in, in some way, we would say, rediscovered during Luther's time mm -hmm. that had been covered up by many other sort of bits and pieces and really got muddied up in the clearness and the just the simple briefness of the gospel was lost. And during the Reformation, Luther gets back to what Scripture talks about when it says, you know, Jesus died for all, and from his death and resurrection comes salvation for all, that eternal gospel. And that's something that continues, as we see here in John's vision, 
yep. even into the end of time. And that's the message that we hang on to. And, and thanks be to God on this Reformation Day observed, if you will, um, for that continuing. He, he has kept his promise to keep that proclamation going forth. That's Other right. thoughts? Nope, that is. That's, uh, that's the connection. And so this eternal gospel that is proclaimed to those who dwell on earth, every nation and tribe and language and people, this is the, the clear and simple word of God that points to Jesus. Now, uh, that seems like a no-brainer for us. That's mm -hmm. the core of everything we do in the church, everything mm -hmm. we teach everything we preach, everything we confess. And yet it wasn't the case in Luther's day. And uh, the word, the eternal gospel, the word of Christ, was completely covered up, and it was covered up by a theology that was grounded in our efforts, our mm -hmm. works, our ability, our knowledge, anything that we could show to God as something that counted toward our ledger, a merit that we could bring before God. And uh, nothing could be further from the eternal gospel. And so as we get into these readings, and we won't, I don't think, spend a lot of time on no. this reading from Revelation, but keep that in mind because you're going to hear this message of uh, freedom, this message of a reliance on the, the word of God and a faith that justifies us before God. Absolutely. So with that, anything else that we need to mention here? Probably just one other thing. Some of you who are very familiar with our church know that that seventh verse from Revelation 14 is actually imprinted in our building for ever and ever. Amen. If you've come through the big main doors of our church and seen sort of the narthex right. area that leads right into the back pews and everything, you've seen some gold German writing up above the second door after you enter. And those words are the German version of verse 7, of fear God and give him the glory. And so uh, you have seen this maybe more than you realize. And so just to draw that connection to our own church here and now. Yep, check it out next time you come in the main room. awesome. For now then, let's jump to our next reading, which is going to come from the, the Gospel of John. And we're going to go to John chapter 8, and we're going to look at verses, I think, 31 through... Is it 39? I think it's uh, 38, maybe? Oh, let's, let me look. I've got the, the list right here in front of me. Oh, it's 36. We were both wrong. All right. There we go. Good thing we checked. It would help check. if I could see it. <laughs> i got to move, move away. I don't have my glasses with me. Okay. Well, this is, uh, this is our Revelation Gospel, John chapter 8. So Jesus said to the Jews who had believed in him, if you abide in my word, you are truly my disciples, and you will know the truth, and the truth will set you free. They answered him, We are offspring of Abraham and have never been enslaved to anyone. How is it that you say you will become free? Jesus answered them, Truly, truly, I say to you, everyone who commits sin is a slave to sin. The slave does not remain in the house forever. The son remains forever. So if the son sets you free, you will be free indeed. That's it. All right. It's a powerful, powerful text. And uh, one of the first things that jumps out to me is maybe that word abide. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, Jesus says, if you abide in my word, and, and that's language he's used, uh, you know, throughout his ministry, and it comes up numerous times in John, and uh, I think of, you know, abide with me, the hymn, you know, yeah. that one comes yeah. to mind a lot of times, but uh, what does that really talk about? Well, you know, one of the other ways we talk about abiding is remaining, mm -hmm. and, and that's a mm -hmm. synonym for, you know, abide in, in our own English language, and that, that's an important aspect, you know, to, to remain with the Lord, to mm -hmm. be connected to his presence. And even as we see later on, the way it's translated in verses, you know, 34 through 36, you get this language of remaining, which mm -hmm. I think reflects back to this uh, abiding truth that Jesus begins with. And so yeah. it's an important word to not overlook and not miss. And so the point is, 
okay, who abides to whom and, and what does that mean? And so let's we can dig that out further. Any thoughts just on that? No, language? I think it's a great word to, to draw out. And I, your Greek is better than mine. And I, don't rem, I don't remember a lot of Greek yeah. words, but I think the word is meno mm -hmm. in here. And mm -hmm. that word abide, remain, dwell, almost live in, mm -hmm. uh, those are all words that, that bring meaning to the way that Jesus speaks here to the Jews. Um, if you abide in, dwell in, remain in, live in. Um, so there is a, um, a connection here that it kind of permeates every aspect of, of life. Yeah, when you brought up a few of those other uh, words to think about, it made me think that this relationship that Jesus describes is not a static one. It's not, mm -hmm. oh, bam, there it is, it's done. I mean, it is there, but uh, abiding gives the sense of that it's living, it's growing, Correct. and it's continually being fed and nourished. Yeah. And without yeah. that, um, you know, it does die. And that's, you know, one of the things that Jesus reiterates mm -hmm. over and over again. If you don't stay connected to me, you're not going to be the ones bearing fruit. You're not going to be nourished uh, yeah. for this life and the life to come. And so, again... Yeah. A lot to pull out in just one simple word, yep. uh, and we see it come through a little bit more here mm -hmm. in just what Jesus says. Well, I think the connection, the other, the other key word, yeah. and there are there are several. Yep. Uh, truth is big. Yep. Free. Yep. Yep. And we kind of focused on this last last year. Yeah. In no, Day. that's right. But but freedom. I mean, in so many ways, that word captures the spirit of the Reformation. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, not only freedom from a, a corrupt church, mm -hmm. uh, that's part of it, but freedom from sin, death, and the devil. Mm -hmm. So to know the word of Christ, to know the eternal gospel, yep. is to have, to abide in the word of God, is to have freedom mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That, that no one else can give. Right. Which is confusing to those whom Jesus is talking to. So the Jews that had believed in him, you know, he tells them, you know, the truth will set you free. And to them, what are you talking about? Mm -hmm. You know, they, they, their sense of freedom uh, deals more with, you know, their ongoing culture and environment around mm -hmm. them to an extent. Uh, they think about their past history and stuff like that. I mean, they think it's an interesting quote that they have in light of everything that they've experienced. Yeah, they leave the out people. about 400 years yeah. of slavery, actually. But, uh, and, and their current yeah. situation, too. Absolutely. Which you, you sit there and wonder, as they are, you know, vassals, if you will, to the Roman Empire, um, you, you wonder where their, their pride is coming from in this, because it really is blinding them to some mm -hmm. pretty major things. But even then, the, Jesus' point is beyond that. Yeah. That even if they were truly free people without any sort of nation ruling over them, that's not the freedom he's talking about, as you just mentioned. And right. it, he talks about the slavery of sin. Right. And I think that's a an image that is so helpful when yeah. you talk about sin. I mean, it's it's not a pleasant image. Yeah. But to think that you're bound mm -hmm. and that, you know, you think of the chains and the shackles that come with Maybe a slavery image, or just the fact that you yeah. can't do what you want. Yeah. Um, that's a really powerful image to think about as you talk about what sin that's is. Exactly and, what right. means. and the contrast yeah. that's set up there, so you think about all those images that are connected to, yeah. to slavery, and what does he contrast that with? Um, ch children. Mm -hmm. the, mm -hmm. the son. The son, his place is in the house forever. Mm -hmm. um, so... The freedom that we're given is not only, um, well, that, that word freedom has a lot of connotations here, but it, it's not just freedom, it's also adoption. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so we are made uh, through Christ, uh, fellow heirs with Christ. And that's, uh, I mean, that is one of the core messages of the, of the gospel. Yeah. And I think, too, just getting back to pulling some more of that abide and remain language in is, mm -hmm. You know, there are two options really in this life. You, you remain or you abide in your sin mm -hmm. apart from Christ mm -hmm. or you remain and abide in Christ void of your sin because of what he has done. And that has two very different end results. You yeah. know, you remain in the house forever. The concept right. of life everlasting, you know, the eternal home of heaven or um, the fact that, you know, when you don't 
that's not not that house is not yours forever. Right. And, and I think that that's a really important contrast again to, to keep in mind. And to make that very practical in its application for us, and you know, this is why the language of repentance and mm-hmm. forgiveness mm-hmm. is so important. And and when I say repentance, I mean daily repentance. The yeah. the words of Luther daily: the old man must be drowned and die. Daily, the new man emerges. That is repentance language. And so what does it mean to to be freed from sin? It means to be honest about who we are, what we need. Mm -hmm. And the the promise of the gospel is that it's always there and it's a free Mm -hmm. gift. Mm -hmm. And that may not be a bad place to transition if we want to look at the Romans. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. So we're going to give you more bang for your buck this week. We're going to get to all three readings and... Uh, that's because they don't tie get used to it. <laughs> they tie together quite well. So we're going to jump to Romans chapter three, and this really starts to pull things even more tightly for us. And this is really a great Reformation text mm-hmm. because this is the book that really gave Luther the light bulb again on yeah. what was missing and, and what was going on. So we're going to look at uh, Romans three, a very very crucial passage, and. Pastor Eggle is going to to read that for us, and then we'll start talking about it some more. What a great reading! Yeah. Now we know that whatever the law says, it speaks to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped and the whole world may be held accountable to God. For by works of the law, no human being will be justified in his sight, since through the law comes knowledge of sin. But now, The righteousness of God has been manifested apart from the law, although the law and the prophets bear witness to it. The righteousness of God through faith in Jesus Christ for all who believe. For there is no distinction, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and are justified by his grace as a gift through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God put forward as a propitiation by his blood to be received by faith. This was to show God's righteousness, because in his divine forbearance he had passed over former sins. It was to show his righteousness at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. Then what becomes of our boasting? It is excluded. By what kind of law? By a law of works? No, but by the law of faith. For we hold that one is justified by faith, apart from the works of the law. And I think that's where we end. Yep, I think you're right. So we just read Romans 3, 19 through 28. So yeah, I didn't people, identify that. No, yet. it's good. And, and they'll have a study guide too, so you can look at that as well. But uh, it's bonus material, so you, we don't give you everything. So. Yeah, that's right. That's right. I was excited. I just wanted to jump in. This is a great reading. It is a great reading. And there's so much to unpack. And uh, I'll let you take first crack. What would you want to hit on first? Well, there's so much. Yep. So the, the idea of the righteousness yep. of God is really an important thing mm-hmm. um, because the idea of righteousness under which Luther toiled was a, a righteousness that pointed back to himself. And again, whether it was good works, knowledge, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. good intentions, experiences, whatever that would have been, um, what Luther discovered is I, I can't get there. Mm-hmm. I, it doesn't matter how hard I try, how much I do, mm-hmm. how uh, much I deprive myself, I can't understand or get to a place of righteousness. And so there was no other way to understand it for Luther. And so what you hear both in chapter 1 and here in chapter 3 is that the righteousness that Scripture talks about, whether it's back in Genesis um, where God credited Abraham's mm-hmm. faith to him as righteousness, mm-hmm. or in other parts of Scripture, righteousness is only God's. Mm-hmm. And so we are made righteous, credited with righteousness, 
Um, not by doing or being a certain way, but by believing the promise. Mm -hmm. And uh, and that becomes the really the core teaching, not only of the Reformation, but of, of Scripture itself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So righteousness, huge. What yeah. else? But I would say that, you know, what you just described, we usually sum up sometimes in that fancy word of justification. And you hear yes. that language of justifying or being the just and justifier here throughout the text. Yeah. And that really is, if we boil it down to, is being declared righteous, not because of something we've done, but because God says so because of what Jesus has done. Yeah. And so that's what you just described. And so if you're looking for a good definition of justification, replay what he just said and you'll you'll have it for you. So and it comes from this section. I mean it's a very yeah. biblical thing, not just some fancy church word that you know we've made up, but really has some great scriptural foundation that's and backing. Right. That's right. One of the things that always stands out to me in this um, setting is just some of the Things that are alluded to, you know, that big word propitiation always propitiation, is one I know. that we need to, to highlight. And, and propitiation, if you hear that word, which you don't very often, I, I want you to think of the concept of atonement. And when you think of atonement, uh, you might think of Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, and that's good. That's where we're headed. And what I want you to understand is what happens uh, to make atonement. Well, blood has to be shed, and often blood is sprinkled on the altar to bring peace between the offended party and the, the other party, and so between God and man. Mm -hmm. And in this case, we see in Romans, from what Paul is sharing, that God has done that once and for all in Jesus, that all, you know, the temple sacrifices, the blood that's been yep. sprinkled up until this point, um, is now fulfilled yep. in Christ, in his death, is an atoning death, not only for everything that happened before him, yeah. but everything that is to come after Christ's death. Yep. That means us. And so his atoning death atones for our sins. I, I Mind-boggling, but the truth of what Scripture shares. And so mm -hmm. uh, when you hear propitiation, think of the atonement, that this is done as a sacrifice for sin for you, for me, uh, for Pastor Eggold. So that's a, an important concept that links us to our Old Testament. Yeah. Don't want you to miss that. And the whole, uh, the, this, the word itself is incredibly unique. Yep. Atonement we use because there's really no other way to mm -hmm. uh, talk about propitiation because it's tied to really this Old Testament term um, that describes the cover of the Ark of the mm -hmm. Covenant or, or the, the, the mercy seat, it's called, the atonement right. cover. Right. And the high priest would literally uh, pour, sprinkle the blood of the sacrifice uh, on this atonement cover, on this mercy seat, to make peace between God and, and men. And, and so this Old Testament concept from Exodus, mm -hmm. and you know, Paul knew his Bible. And Paul is applying that word here to what Jesus has done. So for, the, for a Jewish audience, they would have understood that in a very specific way to talk about the piece that Pastor mm -hmm. Schaefer describes. Yeah, thank you for filling on that. That's helpful. Well, on this, we could go on and on yeah, we about could. this, but it's, it's a great word to highlight. Yeah. One of the other verses that I, I always like to pull out is yeah. verse 26. Uh, it was shown, or it was to show his righteousness, God's righteousness mm -hmm. at the present time, so that he might be just and the justifier, the one who has faith in Jesus. And the reason mm -hmm. I like to really harp on that verse mm -hmm. uh, in a good way is that a lot of times when you hear this eternal gospel, it's easy to say it's cheap grace, that, you know, God is, you know, basically just sweeping things under the rug. And mm. it doesn't matter anymore. And the right. point that we see here from Paul is that not only does God, you know, justify the sinner, but he pays for those sins and right. he remains true to himself as one who hates sin, who is just right. in saying that the punishment for sin is death. Right. And that's where, we, again, we see this beautiful exchange of what is Christ becomes ours and what is ours becomes Christ. And in that exchange... God remains, you know, faithful. He isn't changing. He isn't uh, lying about who he is. He right. hates and he punishes it, but he does so for our sake mm -hmm. on his son, 
Christ and yeah. not on us. And so I, I think that's a great passage for any of you who struggle or have heard that argument that the eternal gospel, this grace that's proclaimed, is some sort of cheap grace. It is not. No. And so that's a, a passage I'd encourage you to keep in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea of justice, mm -hmm. which is a word we hear a lot these yeah. days. Yeah. Justice, from a Christian perspective, happens on the cross. Yeah. Yeah. And that yeah. idea that Pastor talks about, the punishment that we deserved was given. You know, So when you say to someone, your sins are forgiven, yeah. and you'll have an opportunity to do that. We all do as Christian right. people. You point right back to the cross. It doesn't matter the extent of the sin. Uh, when a when a, a repentant sinner hears the message of Christ, uh, it it lifts the burden, you know, because it points back to something that has already been accomplished. Mm -hmm. So it can't be changed. That punishment has been given, and that's you know, again, there's nothing left for us to do. That's the heart of the Reformation mm -hmm. message. We are free. Absolutely. Well, have we done enough? Uh, yeah, and I think, you know, just keying in on that last verse is a great summary of the whole day. And yeah. So we might as well wrap up there. If you didn't hear it before, hear it again. Uh, Romans 3.28, For we hold that one is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. There's not much clear statement uh, in all of Scripture that really gets yeah. to the heart of what we Want to never forget yeah. and never lose sight of no it. No ifs, ands, or buts. Right. It's done. Amen to that. It's done. So God's blessings to you as you prepare for this Reformation weekend. It's a great time if you have a chance to dig into more of that history. Certainly do so. The Luther movie is a great one to watch during this time frame. If you have a Definitely. chance to pull that out, that's great too. But uh, this is part of your heritage and, and embrace it and enjoy it as you get ready for this coming weekend. Well, take he's, care. He's preaching, and he's going to do a great <laughs> job. I can't wait to hear his sermon. <laughs> Pressure's on now. Yeah, it'll All be right. great. Thanks. Thanks. Bye.